Welcome to Part 2, Chapter 4, The Hotel's Duty to Receive Guests and Its Right to Refuse Guests. This is the first in a series of chapters that will examine the relationship between management and guests. At the outset, I want to reiterate that this is primarily a law class, and you should always keep in mind the dichotomy between customer service and legal rights and responsibilities. As we said in the Part 1 learning module, there are times when the law and our desire to provide excellent customer service will diverge. Our competencies for Chapter 4 include a discussion on our duty to receive guests and when we can refuse service, a review of civil rights laws and how they guide our decision making, as well as what happens if we run afoul of these laws, our duties with regards to minors, and finally, some discussion of advertising to guests. As we did in Part 1, I want to start with the common law tenant of our responsibility to guests and see how that concept grows into our modern statutory law. You will remember that common law is judge or court-made law, and statutory law is made by state and federal legislatures. So we once again start in merry old England. If you will remember, the common law rule we talked about in Part 1 was an innkeeper under common law would be liable as an insurer for the loss of guests, property, and safety. This was due in large part to how dangerous roads were at night and travelers' susceptibility to being robbed, beaten, and even murdered if they were left outside without secure lodging for the night. Believe it or not, the basis of much of our modern law was espoused in the English case of Rex v. Ivins way back in the early 19th century. In this case, a traveler came knocking at the door of a roadside inn after the proprietor and his wife had gone to bed. The wife rose from bed, came to the window and spoke to the traveler, but then refused him lodgings for the night. In this case, the court held that because the road was such a dangerous place, quote, the innkeeper is not to select his guests. He has no right to say to one, you shall come into my inn, and to another, you shall not as everyone coming and conducting himself in a proper manner has a right to be received. For this purpose, innkeepers are a sort of public servant. Even though this case is so old, I see it quoted and cited in Supreme Court cases even up to modern times, right up until today. And this case brings up two important themes. First, we have a duty to accept guests, and second, we can refuse them entry if they don't con conduct themselves in a, quote, proper manner. We're going to spend the majority of our time today talking about accepting guests, but I'd like to address the easiest of the concepts we'll be talking about up front. Even though I'll be jumping ahead a little bit in our competencies, I'd like to discuss our right to refuse service right now. Now, remember, the overriding principle here is that we have a duty to serve our guests, there are, however, a limited number of circumstances under which we can refuse service. If you think about this, it really makes sense. We have a duty to our guests, all of our guests, not just the ones standing in front of us and trying to get a room. So just as the English court said in the early 1800s, everyone coming and conducting himself in a proper manner has a right to be received. And so that would seem to indicate that if you are somehow not acting in a proper manner, that you can be refused. So generally, the courts have held that if, if the guest is acting in some way that leads the innkeeper to believe that they may bring harm or disrupt the peace of the other guest, then they can be refused. So here's our list. Somebody who's drunk and disorderly, uh, has a contagious disease that they might pass on to another guest, uh, that they're bringing something dangerous, such as an animal or a gun that's not allowed. Um, if they're unwilling or unable to pay for hotel services, they don't have to be uh, allowed. And of course, if the hotel is out of rooms, they uh, don't have any available accommodations, then they don't need to be let in. So that's really it. There are very limited circumstances under which we refuse to rent a room to a guest. Which makes sense if you think about it. The fact that hotels are in business to rent room and give guests a good experience means that the majority of the time we want to rent rather than to refuse. So we have covered our common law duty to receive guests and the situations under which we can refuse to receive guests. And now we want to move on to how the common law developed into statutory law. That is primarily through the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964. 
The concept of civil rights is an important one for us this semester, and one that we will return to again and again while we are studying the relationship between management and guests, as well as management and employees. Civil rights are based on a person's identity. They are sometimes referred to as negative or hands-off rights, as in, keep your hands off my right to do or not to do this thing. Under the United States Constitution, a person cannot be refused their right to do or not to do something based solely on who they are, man, woman, the color of their skin, their religion, etc. The government's responsibility is to keep their hands off and allow people to participate in the free exercise of their rights. To put this another way, the government cannot discriminate against you because of your identity. Let me give you an example of this concept at work in a historical event you are all familiar with. In the 1950s, the city buses in Montgomery, Alabama, and a lot of other places, had a section of seats for whites only and a colored section. On December 1, 1955, Miss Rosa Park sat in the white section and refused to give up that seat when ordered to do so. As we all know, she was arrested for violating this example of a segregation law. So what you see here is the government making a law that restricts a citizen's ability to the free exercise of her civil rights based solely on her identity, in this case, the color of her skin. This heroic act, along with a host of similarly extraordinary and brave acts by others, eventually led to the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964. Specifically important to our class and our study is Title II of the Civil Rights Act which deals with public accommodations. Title II specifically talks about places of public accommodation, which are defined as things like inns, hotels, motels, restaurants, cafeterias, bars, theaters, sports arena, etc., and states that, quote, all persons shall be entitled to the full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, and accommodations of any place of public accommodation as defined in this section without discrimination on the ground of race, color, religion, or national origin. Prior to the enactment of Title II, scenes like this were all too common. I understand, but what's going on? This gentleman says that I'm not permitted to dine here. No, you don't understand. He's playing tonight. He's the main event. I'm what? sorry, but it is the policy of the restaurants. Everything all right? Uh, no, it's not all right. By the way, that clip is from a movie called The Green Book. The title refers to a guide put together to show African Americans traveling through the South during the Jim Crow era where it was safe to eat or where they might find a hotel to stay for the night. I included an excellent 60 Minutes piece on The Green Book in your additional materials, and I encourage you to spend a few minutes watching that video. So now that we understand that hotels are covered under the public accommodations laws in Title II of the Civil Rights Act, we can discuss remedies available to an aggrieved person. If a person is discriminated against by a hotel or other place of public accommodation in violations of the provisions of Title II, they may bring civil action in federal district court to seek preventative relief, such as an injunction. An injunction is essentially the court ordering the hotel to admit the guest and comply with the law. Interestingly, the court may award the prevailing party reasonable attorney's fees, but at least in Title II, compensatory damages are not provided for. There are numerous other laws, however, which do provide for such damages. In addition to civil actions brought by individuals, the Attorney General of the United States is authorized to bring civil action if there is a, quote, reasonable cause to believe that any person or group of persons is engaged in a pattern or practice of resistance to the full enjoyment of that any of the rights provided by Title II, and especially if the case is of general public importance. And this is exactly what happened in the Adams Mark Hotel case in Daytona Beach in 1999. The U.S. Justice Department charged that the Adams Mark Hotel chain was discriminating against blacks by charging them more than whites, offering them less desirable rooms and requiring more security during their stays. Eventually, the case was settled out of court in 2000, and Adams Mark reportedly agreed to pay $4.4 million to individuals who were either guests of or visitors to its Daytona Beach Resort during the 1999 Black College reunion. 
As part of the agreement, the Adams Mark Hotel chain also agreed to provide training to its officers, managers, and other personnel. Now, you will remember that in addition to federal laws, like the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964, each state has its own system of government and enacts its own set of laws. And so, no matter where you end up working, you will need to familiarize yourself with the additional state and local laws governing innkeepers. These laws vary widely by state and by region. I have provided you with two resources and your additional materials to aid you in your research. First, a link to the National Conference of State Legislatures, Public Accommodation Laws, and second, a PDF of the North Carolina statutes governing inns, hotels, and restaurants. I caution you while, that while these may be helpful, neither is exhaustive. So that brings us to our discussion of one subset of guests that we haven't yet talked about, minors. In very general terms, it is the policy of most hotels not to rent to minors, who is someone under the age of 18. Interestingly, the reason may be based more in contract law. If you will remember our discussion in Chapter 2, the law of contracts, there are a number of elements which must be present in order to have a valid and legally enforceable contract. One of those elements is capacity, and specifically, legal capacity. In other words, if a guest is under the age of 18, they do not have the legal capacity to create a binding contract. In other words, if a hotel rents to a minor, the contract is voidable at the discretion of the minor. The result? The minor does not have to pay for the contract or the room if they don't want to do so. Now, there is a very limited exception to this rule, which probably won't apply in most situations. But in some situations, under the doctrine of necessaries, a parent or legal guardian can be held liable for necessaries provided to a minor, that is, food and lodging and things like that. I said this is a very narrow exception because it must be that the necessaries are not available somewhere else. So if there is food somewhere else, if there is a room at home for the child, then it is not necessary for the child to live at the hotel. And so you can see how that can be a very narrow exception. Another very narrow and uncommon exception would be where the minor was legally emancipated from the parents and therefore responsible for their own necessaries. Okay, to wrap up with our last competency, it is probably obvious, but not only is it against the law to discriminate against guests, but state law may provide sanctions against hotels or other places of accommodation that indicate in any way through their advertising that certain guests are not welcome based on their identity. Okay, before we finish, I just want to wrap up a few things. As I've mentioned throughout the lecture here, in your presentations and additional materials, I've got uh, lots of great information to supplement what we've talked about here today, including some of the statutes, uh, some scholarly articles, some videos, and things that will help, uh, hopefully help us to understand what we've talked about here today. I will add more as we move through the other chapters in part two. And just as a final review, go through our competencies. We've talked about a hotel's common law duty to receive guests that bubble up through English law. We talked about hotels came under the coverage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 through Title II and the Public Accommodations Laws. We talked about some of the remedies available to an aggrieved person, including injunctive relief and compensatory damages. We talked about a hotel's further obligations in their state civil rights laws, which vary widely from state to state. We have summarized the business reasons why hotels should not unlawfully discriminate, because the whole idea we are in business is to put, quote-unquote, heads in beds. So it doesn't make any sense for us to tell certain people they can't stay there. If we want to be profitable and we want to stay in business, we want to put as many guests as we can into our hotel rooms. We talked about a duties hotel to receive minors and how that varies from state to state, and the contract law implications thereof. We talked about the circumstances under which a hotel may re re refuse to receive a guest, which mainly deal with that guest's um, ability to harm or make other guests uncomfortable. We talked about some of the liabilities for wrongful refusal to receive a guest, and some of the anti-discrimination restrictions on hotel advertising. And that is it for this chapter in part two. As always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I know I hope you have a great day.